Everyone in the audience knows what to expect of animals, but to see them react to this foreign creature who has uh, the biggest heart in the world, it's, yeah, it's very moving and, uh, and it's funny. It's, I think it's got everything, really terrific. Well, I thought it was very emotional when a bright bill was going off to migrate and knew that he was leaving Roz for a long period of time in the book. But then when you see it in the movie and the, the looks, the eyes, I mean, it's just incredible. You try and prepare as much as you can. I read the full book, all 279 pages, and then I read the script, uh, which is uh, captures the essence without being, you know, rote for rote duplication of the story. But uh, here was a, I had a real advantage because they had several sequences finished so I could actually see uh, what the movie's going to look like. The experience that I've had um, recording my first DreamWorks animation movie has been um, in incredibly fun, incredibly hard work. Um, I've always had an inkling how much work goes into these kinds of um, experiences. Uh, it's no surprise, but I still am fascinated about how much uh, goes into it from uh, so many different levels both technically and creatively and physically. I think there's so much um, vocal performance capture that I wouldn't be able to do without um, my d director, Chris, and everyone that's on the other side of whatever you call it, glass. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and how, you know, just how much heart and brain and body goes into the whole thing and how much collaboration um, is involved in terms of uh, 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 being on this side of creating a character like Fink. Fink the fox, apex predator, incredibly, incredibly charming, foxy uh, little guy with a bushy tail. And um, uh, devious, but incredibly loving. Nothing like myself. He's been an incredible guide for me. Sometimes I need him to do it for me so that I can um, uh, do it uh, my way. And he'll play the scene with you. And he's an incredible um, director, but also a really, really great scene partner and kind of um, uh, a gu guide into not just like the root of the character, but the root of what you have to make the character uh, come alive. Remember, there is nothing he can do that you can't. Brightbill is where he belongs. And now you can return to your solitary life of struggling to survive on an island where everything wants to kill and eat you. I will register that as a 10. I miscalculated. I should have considered your emotional wavelengths. Negative. That gosling stalks me, emits noise, and makes simple tasks more complicated or impossible. Hello! I am Rosam7134. Negative. I do not have the programming to be a mother. <laughs> Chris was right by my side while I was doing it, so I was here and he was there. So we were in the same room and he just talked me through it. He just sort of said, you know, what he, you know, what he wanted. Um, how he thought this character would sound, and I just launched into it, and he laughed. So you know, obviously, did something right. I do like doing um, animation because, like all sort of creative processes, it starts off being very small and very kind of minimal. It's just a me in a box with a mic, and then a year down the line, you see what that turns into, and it's something that everyone can kind of share. So it stops being just about me and the microphone and the box and becomes a much sort of bigger thing. And I enjoy that aspect of it. I like it when it stops being you know, about me, I suppose. It's a huge honor to be asked by DreamWorks to do any of their animation, and this one in particular, because I was lucky enough to be shown a 10 minute clip by Chris 
of the mother teaching the bird to fly where the bird would fly off forever. And it's one of the most beautiful things. And yeah, it sort of warmed my heart then and I knew that I was in the right place. At the beginning of the film, Roz is this kind of somewhat slightly unfeeling robot. Um, and I guess that you could say that Bright Bill kind of teaches her, as not just Bright Bill, but Bright Bill kind of teaches her this, you know, the idea of, of kindness and, and love. And the, their relationship is obviously mother and son. And, and it, it, it's very clear that that just gets stronger and stronger throughout. And the love and kindness that Roz learns is what, you know, eventually kind of helps them succeed in the film. So um, I think that's one of the, the really key themes. Right there, the monster. That's not gonna work. He needs to eat, swim, and fly. Fly by fall, failure is inevitable. But oh, I promise, there is magic along the way. Anyone seen my lost fuzzballs? Smelly, bitey. Do either of you know more about flying than you did swimming? Look, Ross, wh whatever task you think you're doing, you don't have to anymore. Okay, you're done. I officially unask. Hey! <laughs> I thought you said they weren't aggressive. That one's different. I've, I've never seen one of those before. Then we are in trouble. Long neck, one of the leaders of the coming migration. I have been watching you both for some time. We geese are a cranky lot. Suspicious of pretty much everything, but at least we're good conversationalists. Bright Bill is a young gosling uh, who has found himself with a slightly dysfunctional family, I suppose you might say, um, and who is basically spending the entire movie and the entire story um, gaining confidence and learning about himself and also just learning to love the differences that he has. The Wild Robot is about a robot, uh, as the name would suggest, who has found herself on this island and doesn't really know what her purpose is, um, and then finds a young gosling and kind of finds a bit of a family on this island, and that quickly becomes her purpose. Allow me to introduce myself, Fink, Predator, and local goose expert, which I know you could use about now. <laughs> Relax. Here you go. Take it. I'm a fox. I do foxy things. It's in my nature. Swimming's easy. I can teach him the way my mom taught me. Swim! Unless you want to stay, because we could hang out and, 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 and do stuff. Don't worry, we're his only friends. He has no choice, he has to say yes. Chris Bauer's music is, is for us, I think, one of the breakthrough um, achievements, on, another one of the breakthrough achievements on the film. Um, you know, Chris's scores, again, he's done a wide variety of types of, of films and, and television series. And what I love most about his music is that it is somehow both contemporary and timeless, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, and it, but it's exactly kind of what we were looking for. And again, we were unsure of the path to get to that musically, um, but something that Chris inherently understood. And Chris Bowers uh, uh, really uh, embraced the, the challenge of this film. Music is filling in a lot of the areas where we have minimal dialogue. And so it's doing a lot of the emotional heavy lifting uh, as well. And so it's a vital component of this, of this film. Lapita, uh, in particular is, is the soul of this movie, much as Roz is. Um, Lupita inhabits that character in a way that lends itself to all these great deep emotional moments that we get to experience. Whereas Pedro uh, is very much kind of the life of the movie. He's kind of the spontaneity of it all. And, and 
he was encouraged um, as he got into the process by uh, us allowing him to be himself uh, in the role, which is something he doesn't often get to do. Uh, and then Kit uh, absolutely is the heart of the movie, much as Bright Bill is kind of the, the center of the story because he's kind of the catalyst for everything that happens. Um, Kit inhabited that role in a way that was so genuine and so, but at the same time so vulnerable and, and made that character as likable as we needed him to be. The style that Peter chose in illustrating the book inspired us in kind of helping us understand that the best way to tell this story was not a photorealistic approach, um, but something that had an emotional response to it. I mean, the, the, the book and the film are, ha, have go to very, very deep emotional places, and we felt we wanted the art to uh, embody that. And, and, you know, the best paintings and artwork from throughout history evoke an emotional response when you see them. And we wanted to convey that as well through the images that we were putting on, on screen. No, no, we're all so boring. All we do is gossip. I dare say Bright Bill is the most interesting thing among us, though none would ever admit it. Bright Bill was never supposed to get this far, you know that. It is more dangerous for him than anyone else, but he has a chance. If where his wings end, his heart can pay the balance. I thought you said they weren't aggressive. <laughs> That one's different. I've, I've never seen one of those before. Then we are in trouble. Rosam 7134, I presume? You were not easy to find. Moments after receiving your signal, we lost it again. Almost as if a certain Rosam unit shut it off. I think it's been a total collaboration between me and Chris. I mean, I remember when I first came in, we really, like, found it in in the session and that's been so exciting because you see something on the page it can go 10 million different ways and you know i really love it when i can get into a director's head and hear what they envision and how a character functions in a story and then sort of like get in there and and find it together because every character should feel different and i have played villain i guess i'm in like a moment of villain wheelhouse but <laughs> but every villain is different and um it's, it's fun to get the texture for this particular story in this world um, so that it serves the story. The character I play, Vantra, is um, scary. <laughs> to me, she's like, you know, if Siri became like a ultra god, you know, um, or if our devices um, became alive somehow. And uh, yeah, and she's so chipper that it's scary which sometimes i feel like that's how it feels like when the the things that are listening to us in the walls um yeah they're probably programmed to have a really good demeanor but they probably think dark thoughts how did you secure a task in a place where nothing can communicate with you Ooh, Roz, what are you doing it is imperative you return to this ship she's right I will not harm anyone. Not while we're in here. I know predators, and those are predators. All right, everyone that made fun of me and mocked my project, admit that you were wrong. Now say I'm cool, and don't you dare lie. The people involved work for years to design it specifically for that size of screen and for that collective experience. I mean, I always, most people I think prefer seeing films in the cinema because of the collective element. But with something like this, which has great scale and grandeur, uh, it would be a shame to limit yourself to a small iPad or a small screen. Um, and if you, if you have the opportunity to see it in the cinema, I would grab it. I do think they'll see something they haven't quite seen before because the, the visual, the design, is a combination of things. It's almost the, kind of like the, 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 the context or the, or the kind of background is kind of impressionistic, but then the creatures are very, very defined. And it's a, it's a killer combination. It's a very, very cool look. And, and, and in terms of the, uh, the story, it's a very inspiring, as you'd imagine, it's a very inspiring, uh, powerful story. It has been fascinating to have a front row seat to the process 
of making Roz and the world that she lives in. I remember, you know, obviously there's the illustration that comes with Peter Brown's book that was the, I guess, the, the source material. Um, but then there was all the interpretations from pencil sketches and then adding color and dimension and texture and, and um, scale uh, that has come through the years. And uh, the fi- to see the final version of Roz in the film as three-dimensional as you can possibly get with a two-dimensional um, medium, it's been so fascinating. And the choices have been very specific uh, to tell this story. One of the coolest things, I think, is that they shied away from giving Roz a human-like face, you know. So, yes, she has limbs and lay, you know, that sort of thing, but her face is just two circles. She doesn't have a nose, she doesn't have a mouth, and therefore she doesn't have expression as we would expect it. And yet there's so much empathy we get from her as she evolves into a more empathetic, more um, individualized being. When we think about the word wild in today's society, in modern society, urban society, it's something that we try and get away from as much as possible, right? It's kind of, it has a negative connotation it, that it is untamed, it is unsophisticated, uh, and therefore it is problematic. Our societies, as we develop them, we seek more order, we seek linear processes and um, predictability. But what we learn from nature is that it is perfectly imperfect and there is a lot of uh, intelligence in in not doing the same things always that there is an order in what would appear as wild and what Roz learns is in order to survive this natural world she has to adapt and improvise and learn to innovate in order to be able to keep up with the the new with the laws of this world Uh, And that's really important to remember as human beings because at the end of the day, we are definitely a part of a wild world. And it is to our own benefit to remember that wildness and hold it dear. Remember, there is nothing he can do that you can't. Brightville is where he belongs. And now you can return to your solitary life of struggling to survive on an island where everything wants to kill and eat you. I will register that as a 10. I miscalculated. I should have considered your emotional wavelengths. Negative. That gosling stalks me, emits noise, and makes simple tasks more complicated or impossible. Hello. I am Rosam7134. Negative. I do not have the programming to be a mother. Allow me to introduce myself. Think, predator, and local goose expert. Which I know you could use about now. <laughs> Relax. Here you go. Take it. You can buy it because it is. It has just such a genuinely uh, human-centric message that is delivered through the story of a robot. You know, and I just thought that was such such an interesting way to get us to see ourselves more clearer. And so. Reading that book made a big difference. The source material is rich and, and meaningful, especially in today's world where we're so often afraid of the things of, of people we, we do not know. Uh, and I feel like we are resorting back to tribal affiliations that can limit us. And here is a book that's saying, you know, that uh, there is a shared, there is there is value in generosity and there's value in kindness. In our very first session, I came with some thoughts and it was really, it was high stakes to see how Chris would take my opinions about things he'd been working on for a much longer time than I had. And Chris was so game. He was always receptive 
always considerate of the things that I offered up. We would have really uh, fruitful debates uh, that really just built uh, a sort of like a framework, a foundation for what ended up becoming uh, Roz's evolution from script to script. And so I felt very well matched to him as a creator. He is highly imaginative, deeply talented, wildly intelligent, and still he's open, porous, and receptive, such that you can come with what you have to offer and he metabolizes it and his creativity only expands. And I found that he too was so um, in, influential to my creative process because he was able to give me notes in ways that weren't weren't prescriptive. He would give me notes that would inspire new thought and then new performances in the booth. So it felt very symbiotic, our relationship. Roz is a robot who is destined to help human beings uh, complete their tasks. She's destined to be of help to the people she serves. But she finds herself on an island that doesn't have any people on it. All the island has is wild animals. And because she knows nothing but to do the job she wasn't intended to do, she goes about trying to be of help to these wild animals. And in the process, she has to learn to be more than she was programmed to be. This is a story about belonging and how you seek it when you find yourself in a foreign world and for Roz she has to adapt to the environment by learning the languages of the animals and really picking up how to survive in this place but in the process she never lets go of her true essence which is to be of help and to be kind and while it seems to be a liability to the animals she encounters who say kindness has no place in this wild world uh, we find that she actually her kindness ends up being her superpower and uniting uh, the the animals of the the island in a time I'm a fox I do foxy things. It's in my nature. Swimming's easy. I can teach him the way my mom taught me. Swim! Unless you want to stay, because we could hang out and, 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 and do stuff. Don't worry. We're only friends. He has no choice. He has to say yes. He's right there. The monster. That's not going to work. He needs to eat, swim, and fly. Fly by fall. Failure is inevitable. But oh, I promise. There is magic along the way. Anyone seen my lost fuzzballs? Smelly, bitey. Do either of you know more about flying than you did swimming? Look, Ross, wh whatever task you think you're doing, you don't have to anymore, okay? You're done, I officially unask. Pinktail is a mother of a bunch of babies and is just dealing with, you know, life a moment at a time, just present here, and then Roz, is there she sees that Roz has this baby now and Roz is going to be a mother so just in the moment going to help her going to guide her I don't think Pigtail is aware of what a profound effect she's having on Roz's life which is a life even though she's a robot Chris is such a great director and so clear about what he wants and really funny he's made my role much funnier than I was delivering it every every single line is like you know what else you could try <laughs> And, and made it funny and great and, and poignant when it needed to be. And yeah, it's been really fun. The beautiful thing about animation is that there's nothing there by chance. Nothing on the screen is there by chance and no sound or voice or bit of dialogue is there by chance. Every second of it is thought out by people who are doing beautiful work and really care about what they're doing. I thought you said they weren't aggressive. Well, th that one's different. I've, I've never seen one of those before. Then we are in trouble. Long neck. One of the leaders of the coming migration. I have been watching you both for some time. We geese are a cranky lot, suspicious of pretty much everything, but at least we're good conversationalists. No, no, we're all so boring. All we do is gossip. I dare say Brightbill is the most interesting thing among us, though none would ever admit it. 
Kit had, in a lot of ways, one of the toughest jobs on the film. Bright Bill is a kind of a character, he's a good guy, he's earnest, he's innocent, and he could be the kind of character that is rather uninteresting and rather flat. He doesn't have like these traits that you can necessarily hold on to. When you're a good character, you can kind of fade away. But our very, very first recording session with him, I can't tell you how excited I was when we came out of that session, because I was like, oh my God, Bright Bill is incredible. His delivery and the depth of feeling that he could get into his voice um, was incredible. Um, he brought Bright Bill to life. He made Bright Bill like sing and fly and be a real dimensional character that I cannot get enough of on screen. It's one thing for him to be on camera and be as appealing and talented as he is, but it's a whole other thing to be able to transmit that with just his voice into our character for our animators. Ross's design, one of the key things that I insisted on was that she not have too much articulation on her face. In general, I gravitate, and I think everybody gravitates towards robots that don't have a lot of stuff, like busy stuff going on in their faces. One exception might be the Iron Giant, who has a movable jaw, and I think he's beautiful. Um, but C-3PO, R2-D2, uh, all the robots from Forbidden Planet, they are just fairly blank. And so we project emotion onto them. And it's one of the things I love about Roz. She has enough going on that you understand that she's talking and speaking and all these things that she's feeling. It's a limitation that the animators went with and pushed them to places that were amazing. They have to play her as a pantomime character. We modeled Roz's behaviors off of some of the things that Lupita had talked to us about. Um, the innocence of Roz, the, um, the agency that she has, um, and, her, and her difficulty in understanding things. And an honesty that can be read different ways. There's an honesty that could be read as being very, very naive. Um, and also it could be read as being kind of cold. So Lupita really really helped us understand an avenue into the character um, where we could really fast track getting to the heart of what her character is all about. There's a, an unspoken through line and theme of adoption, really, in this whole thing. The idea that you don't have to be the parent of something to be its mom or its dad or something like that. So Roz is struggling with this whole role of being a mother. She doesn't want it. She has to accept it against her will, and then she has to deal with it, and she slowly begins to feel like, well, maybe this little guy could possibly maybe be my kid in a way. Um, in fact, right before Bright Bill flies away for the migration, she has a moment that I wrote into the script where she says, thank you for looking after my, and she catches herself and says, for looking after Bright Bill. And so she almost said, kid or my son or something like that. And it's a very, actually, actually very parental moment because it's an examination of what does it really mean to be a kid and what does it really mean to be a parent. Years and years ago, I dreamt of the idea of having a film that looked like it was illustrated, that looked like it was painted. Um, because there's something about analog art that is just, it can't be replaced. Um, I started in the days of, of analog hand-drawn animation and I'm really, really grateful for that because seeing people paint and, and create these things is like nothing else on earth. CG animation eventually got to the point where, you know, we were all dazzled by it. And as a director, one of my favorite things that I got with CG animation is the ability to move the camera. Moving the camera in space is a huge part of storytelling. Um, but one of the things that we lost was some of the details and the warmth that you get in these hand-drawn characters. Um, so very early on, based on the look of the book and with the subject matter that we were working with, I had a concern that if we went with a, a what is considered to be a traditional CG look, what have we what we have all become habituated to as a CG look, might play too young, and I didn't want anybody to look at this film and feel like, oh, this is just for little kids. This is absolutely a film for everyone. The thing I liked so much about this book was the subtle but powerful emotional through line. It's the thing that I connect with when I read any story is the emotional wavelengths. Um, I love adventures, I love stories with heroes and villains and all that kind of stuff, but the stuff I always connect with is the smaller, more intimate things, the feelings that these characters are, are feeling throughout their stories, because I think that's the most powerful thing that anybody can hook into as an audience. And as a filmmaker, that's the stuff that I hold on to. I would say that emotional turning points are like, imagine those being ski poles, 
and you're like turning around them. And as long as you know those emotional turning points, you can turn the story at the right time in the right places. The message of the movie is that kindness can be a survival skill. Roz is an unrelentingly kind character. She's got this innocence and this drive to help that was programmed into her. But the more damage that she takes out on this island, in this wild place that she was never really designed to be, the more damage she takes, the better she gets, the more she learns. She doesn't turn bitter, she doesn't turn angry, and she doesn't give up. And I think that's the message from this movie that I hope everybody would take home with them and that would resonate with them, is that your character can withstand a lot and it can be better for it. It's far, you know that. It is more dangerous for him than anyone else, but he has a chance. If where his wings end, his heart can pay the balance. Rosam7134, I presume? You were not easy to find. Moments after receiving your signal, we lost it again. Almost as if a certain Rosam unit shut it off. Tell me. How did you secure a task in a place where nothing can communicate with you? Ooh, Roz. What are you doing? It is imperative you return to this ship. She's right. I will not harm anyone. Not while we're in here. I know predators, and those are predators. All right, everyone that made fun of me and mocked my project, Admit that you were wrong. Now say I'm cool, and don't you dare lie.